ear equalizing techniques. Active ear equalizing is not a natural activity for humans. In fact, many people are actually a bit scared of their ears and describe the fullness of equalizing as uncomfortable and even painful. Frequently painful memories of childhood ear infections add to this fear, and these individuals are likely to be very cautious in equalizing and in fact may be ineffective in doing so. The confusion surrounding ear equalizing is made worse by the fact that it's hard to describe because how hard should you blow if you're supposed to blow until the ears equalize as such as with the Valsalva technique? And what would successful ear equalizing sound like? Divers should also be told specifically to not Valsalva or hold their breath during ascent. And so when instructors try to explain this to divers, particularly novices, it becomes rather difficult to put this all together. Also bear in mind that divers that appear rather squeamish about equalizing their ears may actually suffer from low-grade anxiety and be more prone to panic underwater. The purpose of this article is to introduce you to several techniques of equalizing that you may not necessarily know about or may not have bothered to practice. Only the most common and useful ones have been listed to provide divers with a number of options, as some people may respond better to one particular technique than to others. The techniques include swallowing or yawning, voluntary eustachian tube opening, Valsalva, Toynbee, Frenzel and twitching. Swallowing and yawning is the natural way in which the middle ear equalizes. Middle ear infections in childhood are largely the result of failure of these normal mechanisms. Even in sleep equalizing occurs about once every five minutes by means of swallowing. It occurs almost every minute while we're awake. Voluntary eustachian tube opening. Some individuals have the knack of opening the eustachian tubes voluntarily by a kind of twitch in the throat or an invisible yawn. Many professional divers eventually master this technique. Valsalva. Perhaps the most popular equalizing method is the technique described by Antonio Maria Valsalva in 1704. It involves blowing against a pinched blocked nose so that air is forced up into the eustachian tubes, thereby equalizing the middle ear. It can unfortunately be performed too forcefully, leading to inner ear problems. Therefore, the safest recommendation to divers is to blow no harder than it would be to inflate a large balloon and never to perform an uninterrupted effort at equalizing for more than five seconds at a time. Toynbee Joseph Toynbee described a technique of pinching the nose and swallowing simultaneously. Uh, the act of the soft palate and adjacent muscles then opens the eustachian tube while a pressure wave in the nasopharynx moves air in and out of the middle ear. As a result, it's a very sensitive test for eustachian tube dysfunction as only a small pressure is required. Frenzel A German flight surgeon, Hermann Frenzel, described this technique for the benefit of Stuka pilots in World War II. It involved moving the tongue backwards quickly against the soft palate, thereby creating a pressure wave, as well as positioning the muscles for easier equalization. The technique is best when combined with pinching of the nose. The best way to teach this technique is to have the subject say kick or hick in the back of the throat while pinching the nose. It's a very gentle technique and therefore very safe. We have found that people who struggle with the Valsalva technique often do very well with the Frenzel technique. Twitching. This is a good technique to get people started who are unfamiliar with equalizing or nervous about equalizing. While pinching the nose and gently blowing, the individual turns the head rapidly to either side. The ear facing towards the front generally is the one that equalizes. The technique can be repeated for the other ear. Several techniques assist divers with mild equalizing problems to get them resolved whilst diving. The first is head tilting. This technique corrects asynchronous equalizing, in other words, where one ear equalizes faster than the other. Many divers find one ear is more difficult to equalize than the other, and by tilting the head so that the slower or more difficult ear points upwards, it makes the eustachian tube more straight on that side and thereby makes it easier to equalize. 
Edmonds technique. This technique exploits the effect of jutting the jaw forward on the Eustachian tube. Again, it opens the Eustachian tube and should be combined with the other conventional equalizing techniques. Lowry technique. Another combination was described by Christopher Lowry and may be useful in improving equalization in general. It involves pinching the nose while blowing against the blocked nose and swallowing simultaneously. It's a bit impractical to do with a regulator in place, but it can assist with the discovery and improvement of equalizing techniques. Lastly, there is a device called the Otovent that is distributed by a company called Invotech, and they may be located on www.invotech, spelled I-N-V-O-T-E-C, dot net, and is marketed as the Otovent. The Otovent has been promoted for the prevention and treatment of otitis by treating negative ear pressure caused by eustachian tube dysfunction, particularly in children. The device is made up of a nozzle and a balloon and is very useful to train novice divers about the correct amount of pressure that it takes to equalize. It also verifies effective attempts at autoinflation. Regular practice seems to improve general ability to equalize. In addition to equalizing techniques, several known factors may compromise the stachian tube function and should be avoided or treated. Many people display low-grade allergy towards dairy products, and thus avoidance of all dairy two days prior to diving may provide significant relief for them. Some people have very sensitive nasal passages. These are people who, for instance, might tend to predict the weather changes or sneeze when they put their feet on a cold surface. For them, preventative use of nasal decongestants may make a big difference. Physical obstructions in the nasal passages are not uncommon, particularly related to so-called polyps or skewed nasal septum. Corrective surgery may be a legitimate and effective remedy in these cases. Then there's inflammation of the nasal passages. This clearly would also compromise the ability to equalize. Smoking and head colds would be classic causes of inflammation of the nasal passages, and it may predispose people to sinus and ear barotrauma. It should be remembered that the ears are really the safety net also for the lungs, and therefore if one is congested in the nasal passages and ears, it's not isolated, and frequently there would also be some blockage and inflammation in the lungs. However, whilst blockage of the ears would only result in pain, or maybe even a perforation of an eardrum, lung problems could be far more significant. Finally, chronic use of nasal decongestants may result in a phenomenon called rebound congestion, which will actually make equalizing problems worse. The two most commonly prescribed medications are pseudoephedrine tablets and oxymetazoline nasal spray. Both are chemical relatives of adrenaline or epinephrine, and they narrow blood vessels and thereby reduce engorgement or swelling. In general, the use of decongestants for the purpose of diving can be justified only if it's intended to improve existing ability to equalize, not to make it possible when it otherwise is not. And even then, it should be taken with caution and no more than five days at a time. It should not be used for the first time whilst diving. Test it on land first before taking it below the surface of the ocean. Prolonged use of decongestants causes rhinitis medicamentosa or a chronic stuffy running nose that becomes unresponsive to decongestion. Divers should know how to preserve and protect their ears. Upon discovering any equalizing problems or ear pain, further descent should be stopped immediately. The diver should then ascend three to six feet or one to two meters to reverse the locked block situation. Various techniques for ear equalization may then be attempted, bearing in mind that the ear should never be forced, and no attempt at blowing should exceed five seconds. If all these measures fail, the dive should be ended. Feel free to call Dan if you have specific questions about your ears, and also consult our website, www.dansa.org, under Downloads, for more information about ears and diving.